Remember, a Hallmark card when you carry enough to send the very best. Tonight from Hollywood, the makers of Hallmark greeting cards bring you James Hilton's Appassionata, starring Charles Boyer on the Hallmark Playhouse. week, Hallmark will bring you Hollywood's greatest stars and outstanding stories chosen by one of the world's best-known authors, the distinguished novelist, Mr. James Hilton. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is James Hilton. Tonight on our Hallmark Playhouse, we present a story of my own called Appassionata. I remember how I enjoyed writing it because its hero is a great pianist. Call him Andre. And I am proud tonight that the distinguished actor Charles Boyer is to portray him. And now a word about Hallmark cards from Frank Goss before we begin the first act of A Passionata. Hallmark cards are like stories from daily life. There are Hallmark cards that are chapters of laughter and tears with their expressions of gay, good cheer and warm understanding. They mark the gala events of birthdays, anniversaries, holidays. For every day is a special day to someone dear to you. And every Hallmark card is very special because it speaks for you. And that Hallmark on the back speaks a special message, too. It says you cared enough to send the very best. Now, Hallmark Playhouse, presenting James Hilton's Appassionata, starring Charles Boyer. Some years ago, against the background of a world in which half of humanity was pitted against the other, Andre played Beethoven's Appassionata to a half-empty hall in an American city. As I sat listening to the fiery master brooding over the keyboard like some alternately avenging and caressing fury, I sensed a strangeness about his performance, and I wondered what could be in his mind while his fingers distilled such magic. That smile, and hands that touch, and voice that praise. Thirty years of concerts. What has it all meant? That life of applause. Loneliness in trains that leave at midnight. Travel without discovery. Sightseeing without vision. Crowded streets. Faces in auditoriums, reception rooms. Only here and there, like stars in a dark sky are the voices and hands and faces one really remembers. Terry, my beloved Terry, my wife. A quarter of a century ago, we spent our honeymoon at Mushroom Lake. Andre, look about you, those meadows sloping gently down to the lake. Let's never leave this paradise. Mushrooms, Terry. Mushrooms growing here in the grass. Tonight I'll fix you a dinner fit for a queen. But, Andre, how do we know they aren't toadstools? Oh, they're not. I'd stick everything on it. You are a gambler, aren't you? <laughs> a lucky one, darling. I warn you. Oh, Andre. Besides, I know these are not toadstools. When I was young in Europe, I earned money by picking mushrooms. I wish I could be more like you. There are no dull colors in your life. Everything is brilliant. <laughs> I'm your opposite. Cool and quiet. You're hot and quick-tempered. And all over in five minutes. All over in a lifetime. <laughs> I love you, Terry. And I love you. You. Even if you are a genius. Uh, how did you know? I read the papers. Oh. A critic said you played the Appassionata the other day as if you had wings on your fingers. <laughs> wings? But how they would get it away. <laughs> Listen, I'll tell you about the Appassionata. I can play it as often as I like, but I cannot always count on hearing it. And sometimes I can hear it without playing it at all. Would you believe I heard it once on the subway? The Apostle not on the subway? I can't really believe that. But it's true. Well, you insist. Why do you suppose it happened? It was because I had just met you. Andre. I was thinking about you, and I had one of those 
perfect moments of happiness that fitted over my soul like a glove. Oh. My funny little cool way. I've never been so perfectly happy. Well, your funny little cool way, you're not cool at all. Darling, have you really discovered that much? I've guessed it all the time. And shall I tell you what I guessed about you? What? That your bark is worse than your bite. Oh, my bark. But my bark is very good indeed. <laughs> <laughs> my John Sebastian bark, I mean. <laughs> he was a very accomplished artist. You know, altogether, if I remember, he created uh, 48 preludes and fugues, dozens of concertos and masses and motets and oratorios and cantatas, and 20 children. Oh, my. And one of those children grew up to be a musician almost as great as his father. Are you conceited enough to hope for that in your lifetime? My dear, I'm humble enough to hope that my son will excel me in every possible way. Darling, suppose he's a girl. Nonsense. My son will be a boy. My prophecy was right. Our child was a boy, and we named him Joseph, little Joe. At the christening, Terry whispered to me, I'll never doubt you again, for you are the luckiest gambler alive. How right she proved to be during the next ten years, I could not lose at anything. We were celebrating our tenth anniversary with Jerry Rugby, my manager and best friend. I can recollect the moment he and I went into Joe's nursery and found him asleep. I was carrying some Beethoven records. Uh, Wall Street's up again, Andre. I do wish you'd sell out some of your stuff. Frankly, I don't like the way things look. Shh. Hmm? Shh. Jerry, I bought these new records for little Joe. I know, I know. You think it's funny, but it's an idea I have. I want them to soak into his mind until they're part of his life. You weren't listening to my financial advice, were you? I shall be the first millionaire pianist in the world someday. And when I am, you know what I'll do? I'll found and endow the best school of music in America. Every youngster of talent shall have his chance. As good a chance as Joe has. Well, have you asked yourself whether Joe has any talent? Now, you sound exactly like Terry. For years, she had tried to keep him from growing up in a world of music. A world where music is as natural as breathing. I expect she has her reasons. She's with him much more than you are, remember? Well, that's another point. Because I'm away so much, everything depends on her. She can make or mar the boy's entire future. I don't think you quite realize what a treasure you have in Terry. Mm. I'm not a marrying man myself, but if I were... You would steal her away from me, eh? Maybe. Uh, I do realize it, Jerry. I'm very happy. Turn it off! Turn it off! Now we've wakened the boy. Who put that record on? I did, Joe. I don't like that music. I don't like it. Oh, but you will, Joe. I promise you. I won't. I won't. And I won't practice the piano anymore. Now, now, you know, I didn't want to practice either when I was your age. But I did, and now I'm happy that I did. And so will you. Shall I turn it off, Andre? No, no, I know what's best for him. Nineteen twenty-eight. A year when there was still fantastic optimism in the air. As for my career, there were more bookings and more tours, but less time for Terry. And less time to make my son realize music was the most important function of his life. One evening, in Texas, after a concert, I met a woman who introduced herself as the Baroness Reifenwald. She was a patron of the arts and uh, very beautiful. Andre, now I've got you alone at last. I can be very personal and ask how you like America. Why, very much. You don't have to say that, you know. Well, of course I don't, but I... I'm sure Europe would give your art a richer soil. But, of course, I understand. It is the money that counts. Just as it has to, I suppose, with so many first-class artists nowadays. That's not a reason. I happen to have made my home here, and my wife is an American. Oh, I see. Well, I'll be returning to Europe in a month or so. Andre... My husband and I still keep to the Reifenwald place in Innsbruck. I hope you pay us a visit there sometime. Perhaps on one of your European tours. I never make any European tours. Mm hmm 
Well, someday you may. When you have a master fortune or a lost one. Because in Europe, you see, it won't matter either way. You'll just be valued as a great artist. So am I here. No. <laughs> here you are just prized as a great artist. I don't agree. I see it will take a great deal of time for me to convince you. Where is your next concert? New Orleans, Saturday night. I shall see you, sir. Hmm. Voulez-vous dîner avec moi à New Orleans après le concert? Entendu, mais alors il faut me promettre de parler français toute la soirée. More concerts, more paper profits in Wall Street, more little tips about Joe's upbringing. Tips that would not have mattered if only Terry and I hadn't made the mistake of thinking that they mattered. Then came an offer of an Australian tour on very good terms, and Terry herself, surprisingly, urged me to take it. You know I love you, don't you, Andre? Yes, I do, but that's another reason for you to want to see me leave. We're quarreling too much, aren't we? I know. Oh, I'm not saying it's all your fault. Very generous of you. I'm not saying it's all yours, either. Now, please, don't be sarcastic. I'm not. I'm deadly serious. I love you, and I love our lives together. But there's something lost, and one of us has to find it again. Do you remember you once said you heard the appassionata on the subway? After first meeting me? Yes, I remember. I want you to hear it like that again. Maybe you will someday, somewhere. Terry, uh, Terry, there is some... Well, uh, I don't know how to say it, but... Well, what would you say if I told you that I had been very foolish? Good boy for telling me. But, of course, I knew all the time. You what? Darling... Are you so ridiculously modest as to think you can be seen with a pretty woman without news of it reaching your wife? So you knew? Of course I knew. Now, please understand. She was not important to me. I hoped she wouldn't be. But why didn't you say anything? What's there to say? Well, what is there to say? Everything you've said. She didn't mean anything to you. I believe that. Uh, and doesn't it mean anything to you? Yes, it does. I couldn't say exactly what. It isn't a matter of forgiving. That's easy. But... Oh, Andre, darling. Something lost. Perhaps that was it. Darling, go away and come back again. Oh, my darling. To me, you will always be as you were at Mushroom Lake. Let's find it again someday. Let's not give up so soon. Terry, only once in a lifetime does a man know such a woman. In Australia, word reached me of the stock market crash. I had been wiped out. I was broke. Instead of returning home to my family for the next two years, I toured the capitals of Europe in an effort to recoup some of my losses. Then came that fateful letter from Terry. When a man is a gambler, he must expect some time to lose. And I lost a great deal more than money. I became a stranger to my son. And I lost the right to call Terry my wife. In just a moment, we'll return to the second act of Appassionata, starring Charles Boyer. There's an old Chinese proverb which says, words are the voice of the heart. And the makers of Hallmark cards understand this proverb well. For they're experts at making words truly the voice of the heart. You see, they realize it's the messages on Hallmark cards which give them meaning. For greeting cards are not just material possessions that you purchase for yourself. You buy greeting cards only to send to others. And you want cards that will carry something of you across the miles. Your friendliness, your gaiety, your sympathy, your warm affection. And so Hallmark cards are created to carry thoughts and feelings. 
For each person, each occasion, there is a Hallmark card to say just what you want to say, the way you want to say it. And Hallmark cards carry added meaning, as you will find if you ask your friends, any group, what name they think of in greeting cards when they want to send the very best. Notice how immediately they answer Hallmark cards. Indeed, it's easy to remember, it would be difficult to forget that Hallmark always means someone cared enough to send the very best. And now here's the second act of a Passionata, starring Charles Boyer. <laughs> From 1932 to 1938, I played all over Europe. Between twos, I stayed at a Reifenwald place in Innsbruck, if the Baroness and her husband were there. Those were the years when changes were taking place in Central Europe. Changes that could most easily be ignored by those who believed art was all important. Then came the day when Hitler took over Austria, and Innsbruck was en fête for the occasion. I must go back to America. America? Are you perhaps again thinking of Terry and your son? Oh, I've never really stopped thinking of them. Oh, what a tremendous ego you have, my darling. You leave your wife and son alone for years. What did you expect, that she would wait for you eternally? Right, Can right. you really blame her? She's only but given you the freedom you seem to have wanted. I know, I know. I do not wish to discuss it. But my dear friend, you simply must reconcile yourself to the fact that she has since married Jerry Rook. Will you be quiet? Must you constantly remind me? I'm leaving for America, Baroness. I'm sorry I cannot laugh here. I get angry. I must go where I can breathe, where I can shout. Please, don't shout now. I'm sorry. You and your husband have been very kind to me these past few years. Is that why you are leaving? You are an artist, not a politician. You have here in this house all an artist needs beauty, peace, freedom. Take things calmly. You can afford to wait. For how long? How much time do you think God will give me? I haven't told you all I've seen these past few months. The savagery. Men of culture dispossessed, starved, terrorized. Huh? So culture does matter to you? I said men of culture. Yes, men matter to me. Really? I'm surprised. I had never quite seen in you so role of lover of humanity. I should have thought being an artist was enough for one man's life. Was it's it? because I am an artist that I feel like that. Fool. Crawling back to a woman who has already forgotten. I pity you. You are getting on in years. As a lover of humanity, you may survive for the day you die. But as an artist, you are bound to decline. And when your genius has left you, people will find you're just a burdensome and cantankerous old boy. Whom could I look to when I became that burdensome and cantankerous boy? For the Baroness was right. My powers were on the decline. I wasn't playing as well as I used to. Fortunately, there were a few in any audience who could make the damaging comparison. On a stifling June day, I arrived in New York for the second time in my life, very tired and suffering from heart strain. The years had presented their account. I was waiting for the steward when the door to my cabin opened, and to my utter astonishment, Jerry Rugby entered. Andre? What? Why did you meet me after... Uh, let's not talk about it now. But I want to know why you came. Did... Did she send you? Yes, in a way. She sent you. Oh, I'm glad. Now I understand. No, you don't understand. I didn't want to tell you yet, but I see that I must. I, I can't have you building hopes. Oh, but I have no hopes, Jerry. <laughs> I wouldn't dream of interfering... Don't think of me as if I had come back. Please. Was. Don't talk like that. She's dead. She... Dear God. It happened about a year ago. But, but you said she, she sent you to meet me. Yes. It was just something she said at the end, sort of giving me instructions. That if you ever came back of your own accord, I was to meet the boat at... 
if you'd let me help you again. Work for you as in the old days. How kind. How... There are no words to tell you. Good. But you won't need to try. No, not good. Nothing can ever be really good again. You know, it's hard. I'd never intended to see her or you either. And yet, to know that she isn't here makes the world a dark place. Tell me, were you happy? Oh, yes, very. You didn't quarrel? No, never. Tell me about the boy. Not much to tell you about him. He's all right. I would like to see him. He's flying a plane for some mining company in Peru. Oh, it's pretty wild. When he's made a bit of money, he quits and blows it on some spree. Well, I gather you don't like him much. I don't dislike him. But I can't help resenting him for the headaches he gave his mother. I see. Tell me, Jerry, that letter I sent, both of you, when I learned of your marriage, did you forgive me for it, both of you? We didn't have to. She wanted you to say that you had put us forever out of your mind because she hoped you would. She wanted you to have freedom. That's why she gave it to you. Because she knew you needed it. If you think she ever ceased to love you, how wrong you are. Mm. There are times in my life, Jerry, when I've heard music in my heart, the Appassionata. It happened once by a lake in Pennsylvania. <laughs> mushroom lake, we called it. Big mushrooms. And I had to explain to her the difference between mushrooms and toadstools. That's like the difference between a right and a wrong. But much easier to explain. Yes, much easier. Strange about the mushrooms. Because she remembered them too. She did. It was one of the last things she said. She had a room facing the sunset. And as she looked at it, she said, it's very beautiful, but there are no mushrooms. That's strange. How it sometimes takes a lifetime to learn certain truths. In my prime, I was the artist to be adored, to be pampered. The people, the audience, what did they matter? Now, I'm grateful to say, people, people, just let me play for you. I'm not good at anything but that. In my tactless, angry way, I love all of you. Yes, even the fidgety boy in the back row. Oh, I shall give him a black look in a moment, but it will mean nothing. You see, I have a boy of my own. Yes. Just an hour, I shall be on a train which will take me to a little town in Arizona. Yes, after all these years of hoping and waiting, I am to see my son again. Hello? Hello. Is it Job? Sit down. Uh, how about a cup of coffee? Oh, thanks. Two coffees. I am... Um, I'm glad to see you, Joe. Thanks. <laughs> I don't think I should have known you, though. I wouldn't have known you either, except for the papers. Oh, you read about me in them? Sometimes. Not like go for the music section. You'll remember that. <laughs> um, now how long can you stay? Oh, nearly four hours. My attend is leaving at 7.20. But, of course, if you're busy, I mean, if... Uh, you have anything now, now why to... look for trouble? I was thinking that at all. Tell me, uh, what are you doing here now? Well, I fly a plane for a mining company. Uh -huh. How do you like the music? Uh, oh, fine, fine. Now, that's the kind of tune I can stand. <laughs> Joe, there's something I'd like to know. You, you couldn't get home to, I mean, in time to see your mother before. No, 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 I, I was in Brazil. I didn't hear about it till afterward. I'm glad. I'm glad there was a reason. It doesn't help. What I mean is... Well, what I mean is I treated her pretty badly one way and another. So did I, one way and another. I can never forgive myself. The one thing she would have hated you to say is that. 
You mean she talked to you about me? Yeah, she said you were good and great and I should be proud of you. Well, maybe I should. <laughs> Although I don't think you're quite the sort of person I figured out. <laughs> but I don't think you are either. With a pot and kettle, anyhow. <laughs> uh, Joe, uh, how, how do you start the uh, music going again? You mean you've never played a jukebox before? It's, uh, no, no. Well, you just put a nickel in that slot. Oh, thanks. Oh, wait. How'd you like to take a ride in my plane? Well, uh, I've never flown at all, believe it or not. How'd you like to begin now? Sure, why not? Fine. Uh, now, you know, sometimes when I take folks up, I give them the whole works just to scare them. Oh, I don't mind. You won't scare me. Still, I got to remember it said in the paper you've been sick. Oh, forget that. Give me the works. Give me everything you've got. <laughs> That's funny, isn't it? I, I never thought I'd like you. Well, you have every right not to. Maybe. But you're all right. Uh, yeah, you're, you're, you're all right. Yeah, you. I've uh, been on my own for a long time now. And, well, sometimes it gets, uh, gets a little lonesome. <clears throat> yes, I know what you mean. Uh, I have been, as you say, lonesome too. Uh, yeah, I, I guess every man needs something besides his work. Uh, what do you say if um, now and then we, we, we meet, get to, to know one another? Uh, would you... Do you think it can be done? Joe. Dad. Joe, would you believe I'm hearing something now that I haven't heard in many, many years? The Appassionata. It's a new life, Joe. Dad. It's a new life for both of us. Charles Boyer for your superb interpretation of Andre. And what wonderful piano playing. Yes, indeed, and we are certainly proud of the pianist in our own Hallmark Orchestra, Mr. Victor, Mr. Victor Piamonte. Well, I enjoy playing your Andre, Mr. Hilton. You seem to have painted the human emotions as richly as an artist paints on canvas. And speaking of artists, Mr. Boyer, I think you'll be interested in seeing the exhibition of the International Hallmark Art Award, which opened today in Los Angeles. The prize-winning paintings by French and American artists now hang in the county museum. Interested, oh, but Mr. Hilton, I'm much more than that. You see, I have almost a family feeling about the exhibition. I attended a French exhibition of the awards at their first showing in Paris at uh, the Galerie des Beaux-Arts. And as I said uh, at that time, I believe that the Hallmark Art Award is a great service to both France and America. Yes, I think we all feel that way, Mr. Boyer. And when do you plan to see the exhibition? Tomorrow, definitely, Mr. Hilton. Well, fine, let's go together. Well, I shall enjoy that very much indeed. Good night, Mr. Hilton. Good night. As friends of Hallmark Playhouse, I think you all will be particularly interested in this exhibition of the International Hallmark Art Award because the paintings are winners of $28,000 in prizes given by the makers of Hallmark Cards you'll see the 70 French and American prize-winning paintings chosen from nearly 10,000 submitted. You have probably seen stories of the exhibition in newspapers and magazines, like the one recently in Look magazine, for it is one of the outstanding art events of modern times, with the high purpose of stimulating the fine art of two nations and broadening public appreciation of art. Now here again is James Hilton to tell you about next week's story. I'm happy to announce that next Thursday we shall present that charming actress Rosalind Russell in a delightful presentation of My Sister Eileen. So please be listening. Our Hallmark Playhouse is every Thursday. Our director-producer is Bill Gay. Our music was conducted by Lynn Murray and our script tonight was adapted by Jack Rubin. Until next Thursday then, this is James Hilton saying good night. Look for Hallmark cards that are sold only in stores that have been carefully selected to give you expert and friendly service. Remember Hallmark cards when you carry it out to send the very best. This is Frank Goss saying good night to you all until next week at the same time when James Hilton returns to present My Sister Eileen, starring Rosalind Russell. And the week following, Gene Crane and Alice McKay as they came to a river. And in the weeks to come, Sanford Salyer's Marmee, the Mother of Little Women, on the Hallmark Playhouse. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting. This is KNBC, Kansas City, Missouri.